Where they at? They cool. I, how do you see the amount of viewers? I, 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 oh, 31 people. Yeah, there you go. You can see. Nice. All right, so it's 2 p.m. Uh, we can start the panel now. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Hope you had a good lunch and a good break. Um, so now we have, you know, our esports panel on how to get a job in esports. Very important. Um, and today we have uh, Lysander, who is our moderator, and also our guests, Felicia Lim, Beatrice Hui, and Dan P. So I'm going to hand this over to Lysander. Um, so we'll have the panel first. Feel free to drop, you know, any questions that you have uh, in the chat, and then uh, we'll do a Q and A at the end. Cool. So Lysander, over to you. All right. Thank you, Alicia. All right. Uh, so I actually planned what she just said on my script, so I don't have to say that anymore. But hi, I'm Lysander, guys, and I'm a esports commentator slash host. I've been uh, doing esports as broadcast talent. So the guys that you see on panels, commentating your games. Uh, since 2013, you know, I just bumbled into it back then, you know, didn't really have a clear path of how to get esports work. And yeah, I, I got into it, worked hard, and uh, have worked with many big companies and their games, you know, Valve, Supercell, Riot, uh, and PUBG. So uh, a, a couple of big games have very fortunate to travel around the world to do esports. And uh, in more recent times, I started hosting a lot more, allowed me to talk to crowds, and uh, work on some esports projects back home, like this one, uh, where you know we can help the new generation of gamers, uh, you know, have a more clear path to an esports career rather than just having to luck in upon them or you know discover them, like a lot of us have uh, today. So um, you know, like like Alicia said, we have um, three prominent figures in this part of the esports world: Alicia from One Esports, Dan P from uh, Riot Games, and of course Beatrice from Secret Lab. Hi guys. Um, how you all doing today? I thought it would be a good time for you guys to maybe introduce yourselves one by one, you know, and tell people what you're about, how you actually got into gaming and how your gaming life um, helps you in your job. Uh, why don't we start with Dan? Sure. Hi, everybody. Name is Dan Pantum Sinchai. Uh, people call me Dan P because uh, of my last name. So mm -hmm. don't, don't be afraid to call me Dan P as well. Um, yeah, currently head of strategic partnerships at Riot Games Southeast Asia. I've uh, been working in gaming and esports for about 10 years. Prior to coming to Riot, I was at uh, Twitch. And then prior to Twitch, I was at Capcom. Um, so yeah, my journey through gaming actually started through uh, the toy industry. I actually, my first job out of college was actually Bandai. And I transitioned to, to gaming after that. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of my, my story in a nutshell. All right, cool. Um, Felicia? All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Felicia, and I'm currently the esports director at One Esports. Um, I've always been playing games. I've got a younger brother, so like the two of us will stay home and play with Bomberman on the old Nintendos. And then um, I started working with a games distributor uh, in Southeast Asia, so I work with publishers like THQ, Activision, Ubisoft, um, to work on consumer retail. And I'm fortunate enough that um, Microsoft at that time was about to launch an Xbox 360 and they needed a product marketing manager and I went over there. Spent seven years at Microsoft uh, launching the Xbox 360 and Kinect around uh, APAC. Uh, during that time, I traveled extensively around APAC to understand the different markets, the different nuances and the needs. So it was really an eye-opener for me to um, see the world of esports and gaming and everybody actually having the same common interest, bringing the world together. And then after that, uh, I moved on to Blizzard Entertainment because I've decided that uh, after spending seven years marketing console, I wanted to do something more digital. And when I joined Blizzard, uh, they only uh, have recently announced that they are going to work on a new IP. So I was fortunate enough to be part of the Heroes of the Storm as well as Overwatch launches. Nice. Um, after that, uh, Blizzard moved its... Um, business to Taiwan and I've got two girls and my family it's based in Singapore so I didn't have, I didn't think that it was appropriate to move so I moved on to One Esports um, since I've been always traveling around the region with the Overwatch as well Starcraft players um, I thought that it would be good to get more focused so I joined One Esports and recently we put on the Singapore Invitational I'm not sure if I'm, how many of you attended but yeah, that was uh, everything by my team and the team at One Esports. All right, nice. Uh, all right, last but not least, of course, Beatrice from Secret Lab. 
Hi everyone, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I am the Global Partnerships Manager at Secret Lab. Uh, we actually have a very flat structure in the company, so I work very closely with the founders Ian and Alaric um, to kind of manage team and event sponsorships, um, licensing deals, global endorsements with streamers and all that. So. You may be familiar with some of our partners like Team Liquid, uh, Riot Games, Valve, uh, Batman, you know, for example. Um, yeah, so it's, I'm very fortunate to be able to kind of like be dabbling uh, across different kind of interest groups um, and meet people from all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, previously, um, I was actually in digital advertising uh, as an internship actually, but uh, this is actually my first job out of university. So it doesn't feel too long ago when I was in like everyone else's shoes and I'm like looking for a job. Um, yeah, so I'm very excited to be here and share more about, uh, you know, how you can get a career in esports. Okay, cool. Uh, so, okay, about uh, getting a job in esports. Uh, like I mentioned at the start, uh, I started my esports career because uh, it was an accident. I joined a kind of a talent contest and I got in, uh, got in through some voting from Facebook likes and, uh, you know, I just somehow got connections to bumble my way to where I am today. You know, there's a lot of hard work involved, but it's not a path that a person out of school would usually chance upon. And, uh, you know, the real question is, you guys are all here, why, you know, how, um, how would you get a career in esports and what are these people, you know, the potential people hiring you are looking for? We're going to be finding out from our panelists today. So uh, I'm going to present this question to everybody here. What skills or experience would someone need if he or she wanted to do what you do? Yeah, I can start. Um, All right, cool. Yeah, so I think the main thing um, that I think the other panelists would agree also um, is passion, right? Having passion in the industry, having passion in gaming is definitely super important. Um, but specifically, I guess I can speak to partnerships um, for, for my role in partnerships. I think it's very important to be resourceful. You know, um, there's no set way in kind of doing things, especially when it comes to spotting opportunities and managing relationships. It's really about kind of like cultivating your own style with that. So I would say, you know, being resourceful, being flexible is very important. Um, also being able to put yourself in the shoes of the end consumer, you know, kind of thinking about, what would they want to see? What what would excite them? You know, what what's the next thing that will kind of make them go wow? Um, so you know, being able to kind of have that understanding of the market um, is also super important. And I think the last thing I wanted to touch on is um, how you can really contribute to the ecosystem. And this is something that's more personal, I guess. Like uh, it depends on your interests. Uh, for me, I'm not as big of a gamer compared to everyone else at my office, um, but you know, I have a lot of other interests, uh, you know, in movies, more lifestyle stuff, I guess. So that's why I kind of like um, add value to my company. So yeah, I would say those are the three things. Um, those are the three kind of skill sets that you would need um, to kind of like be successful in partnerships. All right, cool. Uh, Felicia, what about, what about you? What skills experience would someone need if they wanted to do what you do? So at One Esports, uh, my main role is to look after events. So I would say that uh, events is a really broad topic. So it really depends on what you want to do. So I would say to everyone is that before you want to get into esports, first figure out uh, what your skill sets are and what you want to do and what you want to achieve. And then from then on, if we were to draw down specifically to events, the things that you will need is to have um, events management skill, uh, having to run events before, whether it's your school events that you put on, whether uh, are you part of a computer club associations, all those are skill sets that are required when you run an event. Other things that to look out for would be, um, is there anything relevant uh, during your school or education that will help in a um, event setting? So this would mean like, um, are you good at pulling various people together, pulling resources together and helping them understand the things that has to be done during an event? Um, are you good at project management, coordination, or if you're really like esports, were you once an esports competitor? Uh, will you know the esports rules and understand uh, how to actually um, help to mitigate, um, let's say, conflicts during a tournament? Like anything that you do during your school uh, is actually really relevant to an actual event. So try to find a linkage there. And when you apply for a job, uh, put all the relevant information that you have, that you've done in school into your resume. And that will serve as a really good experience because honestly, esports is niche. Not many people have the exact relevant experience that uh, a recruiter is looking for. 
But if you have done something in school or during your free time after office hours that are relevant, you should put everything in. All right. Uh, I think that's a really good point. And we are actually going to talk more about that, you know, the, how you can show your passion for esports when it comes to applying for this. Uh, but before we move on, uh, Dan, do you have something you want to add to this? Uh, what skills or experience would you, someone need if he or she wanted to do what you do? Uh, Dan, hi. Oh, uh, yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, the, the main thing is that we want people who are professional. So, um, you know, with, with gaming and esports, it's a lot of fun and it's a lot of, you know, doing what you love. But at the same time, you know, we, we do need people who are organized and capable and, and have a professional look at how they, they do the work. And I think the other thing that's really important is for people who to, to realize what their strengths are. So we need people who realize what they can bring to the table and what they can offer to um, the different work. So having a clear view of what you're good at and what you're not good at is really important, I think. All right. Uh, okay, so let's move on to the second one. What does your company look out for when looking to hire talent? Of course, each of you guys have a very different companies when it comes to esports. You know, one is like one esports is more event sided. Um, you know, so Secret Lab is a you know product, you know, merchandise and partnership side. Of course, Dan, you're from Riot, which is, you know, a, from a developer standpoint. So there are a lot of different uh, avenues that we can uh, draw experiences from. And also, you know, you guys can share what each uh, individual company or each individual aspect of this esports industry uh, you know, what do they look for? What do they, uh, you know, what do they like when it comes to hiring talent? I think Felicia, earlier on yesterday when we talked a little bit, you had something you really wanted to share in terms of the applicants that you went through uh, when you were hiring for your team last year. Um, yeah, so um, I was fortunate enough to um, be able to look through literally like hundreds of resume. And the things that we, we do, it's... Um, when, when an applicant submits a resume for a certain role, it's really important that they understand what the role is about. So the things we look out for is whether you have the relevant experience. So that's the first match like HR would do. So once you have the right experience, then we'll look at uh, what are your passion. And a lot of the time we realize that for gaming, because it's such a passionate um, subject, it would be really helpful if you submit an application with a cover letter. Um, include why you think that you are suitable for a role, what your objectives are, and what kind of um, contribution you think that you can provide to the company. I think that's the first layer. And after somebody if who read your resume understand that, hey, this person is really passionate, uh, the chances of you getting a call is really high because uh, out of the uh, 100 applications, I think less than 10% actually made an effort to tailor their resume specifically for the job and include a cover letter. So I would say to anyone that that actually gives you an uh, a, a itch over the rest of the applicants. Yeah. All right, cover letter. And, and the funny thing is, I, I'm very surprised mm -hmm. to hear this because in school, I, I think mm -hmm. at least my school, they actually said that, you know, you know, when you go through that course in applying for a job, you know, the, the how to write the email and every how to submit the CV, they actually said that cover letter is very important. Uh, it's actually part of the lesson. So I'm surprised that less, uh, very few people have sent you guys a uh, cover letter uh, you know, when they're applying for a job like esports. I think that is also one of the stigmas we want to work around that esports is not really professional uh, in a lot of aspects because it's all just, you know, just a game kind of thing. I think that's what we're trying to work away from. And I think that's what's really important when we guys are, are we're speaking to you, you all because all of the companies that you guys represent are, you know, strong, powerful brands in the space. And, uh, you know, I, I, like, I like that there is more seriousness being applied to esports careers now. Uh, okay, so moving on, uh, Dan, as well as Beatrice, do you guys have something in you know, particular that you guys look for when hiring? I mean, Beatrice, you don't actually do the hiring, but I'm sure you, I'm sure you know the process or what, you know, Secret Lab looks out for. Yeah, so uh, this one is something that I'm really interested to share because um, I think it's difficult to kind of like understand from the outside uh, how the culture of the company is like, right? So, and I think ultimately, you know, how a company hires ultimately depends on uh, the culture, what's suitable for their culture. And at Secret Lab, um, like I mentioned earlier, it's a very flat kind of structure. There's no, it's not about rank or age or experience or anything like that. Um, we have this philosophy, um, 
that the best ideas win. So I think mm. when we're looking to hire, um, you know, new, uh, new, new, new staff, we are really looking at people who are unafraid to kind of share their ideas um, and people who have a lot of passion and drive uh, because all of us, like, I, I joined the company when the company was about 30 men strong and now we are at about 100 or over wow. 100. So it's, it's really like a big family, but, you know, uh, Secret really empowers each and every one of us to... Um, you know, contribute our, our own kind of viewpoints, our own ideas that we can bring to the table and mm -hmm. nothing is nothing is kind of like off limits, uh, you know, when, when discussing ideas. Uh, everyone cares very deeply. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's really um, just, you know, being able to find a good fit for that kind of culture. Yeah. yeah it's uh, really cool and, uh, you know, see, I, it's really refreshing to see that, you know, that uh, whenever, because I think a lot of times us gamers are, you know, when we were younger, you know, our hobby of gaming isn't treated seriously. So when it comes to these kind of environments, it can be very refreshing. So, uh, you know, it's good for those people back in the chat to know about this because a lot of times we try to repress our gamer side to not appear nerdy or anything. And I think that's uh, very, very nice to hear. All right, uh, Dan, what about you? What does uh, Riot look out for? Or what do you, what do you look out for uh, when trying to hire new faces into the company? Yeah, definitely, you know, being passionate, I think, is, is really probably the, no the number one thing we look at. Uh, we really want our candidates to understand the gaming space and have, you know, their own viewpoints, but also be well researched. I think that it's really easy to tell when you have a candidate who's clearly done their homework about the company and kind of the challenges. And again, I kind of going back to how they can help address some of the challenges that the company is facing. Um, it's, it's really, really easy. And I think, I think a lot of people out of school probably, you know, send their resumes to dozens of different companies just trying to try to get any kind of catch. But I think, you know, it's it's really really obvious when when you're applying for a role that you don't understand. So when we hire at Riot and you know just in general, um, that's really the first thing that that allows us to cut you know seventy five percent of the candidates just right off the gate. Wow, seventy five is a large number. All right, so uh, research, be genuine, uh, show your passion and uh, show your creative side. Don't be afraid to voice yourself. I think those are the key points that we got from this. And also a quick note to the people in the chat. Uh, we have 55 people here. So a little bit of math, so about 40 plus of you guys in the chat. If you are going to uh, you know, be joining us for the remainder of this, remember to, you know, Think about some questions you want to ask because in the uh, last 10 minutes, we'll be opening up to the floor where you guys get to ask questions to any one of these panelists. You can ask me as well, but uh, I would recommend you ask them uh, about the jobs and, uh, you know, ask them anything to find out about uh, how to get a career in esports because uh, this is a one uh, in a lifetime opportunity to get a uh, direct reply from these people instead of waiting behind a hundred people in the uh, applicant queue. All right. So moving forward, uh, we have a third question here. Esports has gained exponential growth in the last few years. Where do you envision the esports scene to look like in the next three to four years, especially in the local area in Singapore and in Southeast Asia? Uh, I mean, this one, you know, I know it's a little bit of a hype up esports topic, but I think it's good to talk about and uh, maybe more about the careers as well. If you guys think there are going to be opportunities opening up in the future, this one I'm going to open up to the floor as well. If you guys have an answer, just hop in. Uh, yeah, I can I can start off. Uh, I think right, that cool. you know the just speaking as Southeast Asia as a whole, I think it's it's in a few years we're going to see a lot more um, interest from governments, and I think there'll be a lot more crossover with you know, different uh, sporting events such as Sea Games and things like that. Uh, I think we've seen a lot of interest from government organizations who recognize the the power of esports and how you know whereas a few years ago it would have been laughed at to to compare esports and sports, but now, and especially in a COVID world where sports are really don't exist, but esports is thriving. Um, I think that the, the sentiment has been changing. So I'm really excited to see how in four to five years that continues to shift uh, and we'll be able to have esports, you know, available to an even wider audience. All right. 
right. Uh, and I think you, it's great that you touched on the COVID thing. Uh, you know, with a lot of esports tournaments having gone online, some say the games industry as a whole has uh, done a lot better. But you know, when, when it comes to uh, you know everyone being stuck at home, but do you guys really agree with this sentiment? I think there is a lot of you know push and pull. Like for example, advertisers not having enough budget to sponsor events, not having enough you know purchasing power anymore. It does affect the cash flow in some aspects, and cash is still king even in esports. So, uh, what are some of the pros and cons in this COVID world? Uh, Dan, you can answer, but uh, Felicia and Beatrice, you guys can uh, chip in as well if it uh, applies. Um, I would say that gaming actually came from online. Everything already is online when you play with your friends. So uh, in terms of having events, uh, honestly, there isn't a significant impact in my opinion because when we run online tournaments, uh, the viewership over 90% still happens online. And that's why a lot of us will watch it on various channels to see what's happening. Um, and then the other thing is that... Uh, the fact that it's online, it actually goes across regions. Uh, every Anyone across the um, Southeast Asia, as well as APEC, can tune in to watch it together. So I would say that um, it actually increases the number of viewership we have during the COVID period because more people are at home, uh, more people are spending time online, more people are spending time playing games. So it's actually the opposite. Uh, things have been going much better. All right, uh, Beatrice, do you have anything to add to this? I mean, yeah. more people are staying home playing games, so more purchases for chess. <laughs> sure, right? yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I think you're completely spot on. Um, yeah. It's not just like customers, right? I also have like my own like personal friends or like partners asking me, do you guys have discounts? You know, like, um, you know, they really need a chair because they're all sitting on some random kitchen chair and working at home. So I think they, they finally realized the importance of a good, like comfortable chair, you know, where you're going to be sitting, you know, hours in this and working. Um, so we've been very fortunate to see like sales uh, an increase in demand for sales um, but at the same time you know we want to be kind of like sensitive to different parts of the world and how COVID has impacted them so uh, we want to be able to give back to the community at large as well you know while we are mm -hmm. in this fortunate position um, back in April we actually uh, had a campaign where we rallied all our partners like Team Secret, Cloud9, Riot Games and so forth so on and so forth um, to kind of donate I think over 400,000 um, FDA approved masks to hospitals in the UK, mm. uh, US and Singapore. So that was a really nice um, campaign that we were able to do um, because of our position in gaming and, you know, the industry. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're still looking out for opportunities uh, in, how, in terms of how we can give back. But yeah, COVID has been uh, a weird time, I think, for everyone. <laughs> Yeah, definitely a weird time and uh, it has definitely also created some uh, unique positions. I think I see a lot of uh, companies that I never thought would come in uh, to the region talk about uh, you know hiring a new group of people, a new team to handle this whole digital uh, you know revolution. You could say you know everyone's moving online, you know there's a lot of new jobs opening and uh, not just in COVID but I think esports opens up some very specific roles that need to be filled and uh, again yesterday when we were talking uh, beforehand, we talked about uh, you know some of the you know, things that are missing in esport in the esports uh, landscape and the type of people you guys are looking for. Uh, maybe you guys want to share a little bit. Um, some of the roles that are unique to esports are things like league operators, somebody who knows how to manage professional gaming teams somebody who understands how to manage their needs during a tournament, for example. Uh, for these group of people, especially for professional players, it's very unique. Um, if they come to you with latency issues, network issues, hardware issues, uh, whoever is a team handler or team manager has to know how to manage them. Another one that we always look out for is uh, anything to do with production or uh, league operations, uh, because it's the... Esports has uh, its unique set of rules for every single game. Every game has a different set of rules. When it comes to bracket system, uh, the difference between round robin, double eliminations, somebody who has been in the industry will understand this and know how to operate along. But if you're new to the industry and you don't understand how this gaming work, it's uh, going to take a while to ramp up to reach a stage where you are able to manage a professional team. Uh, Dan, Beatrice? What are, what are some new jobs that esports has created? Some new kind of uh, unique titles. 
Yes, because uh, a lot of new elements are introduced with esports. You know, league operations is one. What about others like you know broadcasting? Some certain unique partnerships. Uh, yeah, I think you know one thing that's you know it's not necessarily new for for sports, but I think you know the whole sponsorship space is something that was you know kind of new for gaming. Um, a lot of the time when we when we we we're talking about gaming before. It was always like the business model is that you sell your games and you you earn your revenue, and like that's how it works. But I think you know with esports becoming part of the gaming ecosystem, making revenue through you know the the sales of the broadcast or ticket sales or merchandise sales is just new revenue streams that have come up through the introduction of esports to gaming has been really interesting uh, and helped create a lot of new positions, um, which you know may have existed in, in other types of. Uh, industries such as you know regular sports but for gaming specifically we're brand new and I think you know as the industry continues to grow we're you know we're also looking for people who can sell sponsorships for for esports people who can create merchandise people who can do all these different kind of things um, so yeah it's really exciting times okay and uh, Beatrice do you have anything to add to that yeah, I mean, for me, it's. I think this is more of an up and coming thing. Um, I think data and analytics and intelligence is something that I, I think is going to be the next thing um, in esports and gaming and like kind of building off of Dan's point, you know, like sponsorship is kind of like a relatively new space, right, for gaming. Um, but it's also important to kind of manage and, you know, really understand your ROI, uh, understand, you know, you know, what a certain tournament brings to the table, for example. So you have companies like esports charts you have companies like i think nielsen also stepping up with some um offerings for data analysis so i think mm -hmm. that's something that could be interesting and could be a thing in the coming years uh, but yeah i think it's still early days at the moment actually if, if there's anyone who has been taking part in online tournaments as a hobby or just out of your personal interest um, those are the things that you can actually write in your resume as experience because you know have gone through a tournament format before, you know how to check in and register, you know how that uh, a basic tournament rules is necessary, uh, you know what best of five, best of three means. Mm -hmm. So all this are actually, even though you might seem that this is just what I do for fun, but in the world of esports, it's very relevant in an actual job. Oh, wow, that's actually very hopeful. Uh, with a lot of uh, online tournaments happening now in the, in this COVID era, it is very, uh, very heartening to know that you know just playing um, in a tournament is actually useful information. Now, I want to tap on that topic. All right, so I think there is a, a little bit of a pri no, a little bit of a scare. Like, okay, I, I'm I'm just a gamer. What am I going to offer to esports? Right, you know, I already studied for something normal and why don't i just get a normal job and my take on it is it, i think a job in esports is kind of like a job in any other industry it's just that the fact that you are a gamer that makes you uh suited to work in that job so like a marketer that's a gamer becomes very good for esports marketing and uh you know a manager for esports is uh, that loves gaming is good because he understands esports um you guys think about that you think uh that is is it just that you are a gamer that makes you good in uh, in the esports world, or is there more to it? Sounds like a little bit of a weird question. I hope you guys yeah. can understand. I think um, the way I think about it is it's, and I just go back to like being professional. I think it's easier to train someone who's a professional and teach them about esports than the other way around. I think it's very hard to have someone who knows about esports but is not professional and teach them how to be professional. Okay. But, um, yeah, definitely having the skills. And like, as you said, if you're good at marketing, you can do marketing in any industry. And if you're a gamer, then yes, definitely. You know, esports marketing is something that I think would be a good fit. But it always comes back to, have, do you have the skill set and are you able to, you know, do the job? And then, it, then you, the passion will, will help push you through. But if you only have the passion and the love, but no skills, then it's much harder, I think, in my opinion. Okay. I think on that note about being professional, I think it's a very good point because a lot of times when we receive resumes, uh, we would see that the candidate would put their social media account and profiles in the resume. So when that happens, it's basically an invitation for the recruiter to click on it. And a lot of times um, you have to understand that whatever appears on social is public. And then when you click on it and it doesn't reflect your professionalism, it's not actually to your advantage. 
So uh, I think a note to especially all the, um, if you're going to apply for a role, do go through your social media account to ensure that that's something that you want to present to your future uh, employer. Uh, delete everything. <laughs> Is the uh, rule of thumb. Uh, but uh, what about you, Beatrice? Do you have something to add on this? No, I mean, I fully agree with Dan and Felicia, actually. Like, uh, we also, I think at Secret Lab, we also feel the same. Like, gaming, a gaming background and understanding about gaming is not, like, a key criteria, honestly. Um, it's really what you can bring to the table. I and mean, it's more about your attitude, your aptitude, and uh, your appetite, really, to kind of, like, mm -hmm. go far um, in this industry. And Secret Lab will empower you to do that, you know? Like, like for example, like, me and Valorant, right? I don't really understand. Like, I'm not the biggest gamer. I play League of Legends, and I play i played arena of valor but i wouldn't say like i'm as big of a gamer as you know compared to ian and alaric for example who <laughs> play like i think over like 50 games right so it's, it's not really about that though like everyone's super open to guide you through and mm -hmm. explain to you the different games um and how things work but you have to be hungry for that knowledge as well yeah, yeah. I think I think the, the 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 bare minimum would be to get gamers. You know, if we we, we you know you, you got to get the plight of gamers to be able to empathize and you know level with them when you're trying to push your messaging. I think that is the important part about being a gamer when it comes to it. But overall, I, I think the general consensus is be a good person that people want to work with first, and then maybe we'll teach you about gaming culture later. Uh, and Beatrice, I actually want to talk more about you know, you know, your career, because you mentioned that this is your first job out of college. And, uh, and I want to find out a little bit more about that. How was that process? How did you end up in Secret Lab? Was this a, no, uh, was this a chance thing? You knew some friends or what? You know, do you just apply and say hey you know what this chair is very comfortable i sat on it once you know maybe i'll work for them <laughs> what, yeah. what was the path okay yeah so this is a this is yeah an interesting story so i mean honestly i never saw myself being in gaming um it was an interest of mine but it wasn't something that i was actively trying to pursue so when i graduated from rmit i was like okay um i actually before i even graduated i was already applying for jobs right i was already like i think six months in advance i was already like looking you know what's on the market um and then i saw an opening for an internship position at secret lab so i mean obviously i don't know about everyone else but for me like when i graduate obviously you want to be looking for a full-time job right mm -hmm. um so i was like i mean this is an internship but i'll give it a shot anyways you know and and funnily enough, like one of my last reports that I wrote um, in school uh, about pop culture, I actually chose to wrote about gaming and how it kind of like transcends like time, you know, and like also space, you know, for example, like in COVID, right, you see everyone kind of like gaming and that's just kind of the go-to activity and it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can still play, that kind of thing. So that was like my paper, right? So I, I never expected... Um, myself to be applying for Secret Lab, but I saw I was like, yeah, I think I think I, I have a shot at this. So I just applied. Uh, and after an interview with the founders, um, they offered me a full-time position, I think, um, yeah, at the next round. So I was, I'm very, very grateful. And it's been a journey ever since then, you know, like uh, I've been able to, I've grown so much in the past two years or two plus years that I've been here at Secret Lab from 30 to 100, you know, and I was like one of the first few people in the company. So it's, and, you know, being able to experience, um, you know, top tier events like TI and Worlds um, and stuff like that, uh, you know, firsthand at the venue, you know, and in a, in a partner and sponsor capacity has been, has been amazing, you know. So I would say, you know, for people who are interested in the industry and you kind of like don't know if this is for you, I would say just, you know, give it a shot because you never know, like, and again, like what, the other panelists mentioned as well like it's something that you can definitely pick up and learn along the way because i think in gaming we're all learning and changing along the way because the industry mm -hmm. moves so fast yeah all right yeah i think uh one day secret lab's gonna take this footage i, I felt that you know a very emotional speech <laughs> and uh, put it in their 10-year montage i think that's for sure <laughs> okay uh thank you so much for sharing uh okay so i i think i also add this question to you guys uh before this uh okay so this one's a little tricky so you know work around it how you will so this question is about benchmarks you know i think uh you know people in the chat you know when they say okay i i understand you're looking for a certain standard a certain you know level are there real world examples that you guys can share that you like you know something in esports something not in esports that you think is the benchmark that people should say hey you know this is something that i uh, i appreciate maybe work towards something like that or maybe 80 percent of that 
uh, you know, give some, some people some level to work with rather than just be good, just be professional. You know, any real world examples you guys can share that you like. I think when it comes to professionalism, my experience is, uh, I would say, get the basics right. So what this means is that a uh, few simple things. Um, when we interview like hundreds of candidates, first impression really counts. So as a interviewer, um, I would say that show up on time to an interview, very basic, uh, dress appropriately. If you want somebody to treat you as a professional and to take you seriously, uh, come to interview, dress appropriately. Um, I have had candidates coming in tattered jeans and slippers. Um, singlets too, and that it's really not professional. Um, and when that happens, sometimes no matter what you say, you, you get a negative first impression already, and you kind of wonder if this person is serious about wanting this particular job. Um, other things to take note of is um, a resume is actually the first encounter that the um, recruiter has with you. So things that I would look out for in a resume would be things like, formatting. Is the resume formatted appropriately? Um, are there spelling mistakes? Are there grammatical errors? Um, are there uh, different font size happening? This kind of shows how detail-oriented you are. Uh, it also shows um, how much effort you put into getting your resume right before you send it out. So just three basic things. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, what about, uh, what about uh, this? Maybe, maybe like, uh, you know, you don't, you don't have to say, uh, you, know, you know, you don't have to say again what Felicia just said. You maybe can say something like, okay, I really like the, like, say, for example, in the area of marketing, you know, is there any particular campaign that you thought was ooh, really cool in esports that you thought like, hey, you know, this is revolutionary, something cool to look up to. I mean, you don't have to mention rival brands or anything, uh, you know, conflicting, but, you know, anything you can share will be helpful for everyone in chat to work towards. Okay, maybe I can speak a little bit about this because if you're talking about campaigns, right, and partnerships, uh, yeah, yeah, there's one particular one, like it happened last year at Worlds. I'm not just saying this because Dan from Riot Games is here, <laughs> but like, I really personally feel very strongly about it. I was there um, at, at, at the event last year. So um, I think last year for Worlds, um, LV, uh, Louis, Louis Vuitton came on as a sponsor, right, or mm -hmm, like a partner mm -hmm. of some sort for um, the Worlds tournament. And, you know, there was performance so riot really makes it a point to make that events a spectacle and an entertainment piece you know so at the start when they had like the trophy case you know unveil mm. um in the lv like trophy case and then also you know kind of extending beyond that to online as well like having a you know like skins um like capsule collections on LV's side, you know, I just think that's a super interesting collaboration that you don't see very often in gaming, right? Usually for gaming, it's like, oh, you think of collectibles or you think of mm -hmm. like merchandise, but this is kind of something that's like kind of pushing that limit a little bit. Um, and it's not for everyone. I completely get that. I don't think, you know, a lot of people will feel very drawn to this, but they're clearly speaking to a particular group of people with this. So I think it's really smart the way they've done it um, and they've done it you know, in ways that matter the most, you know, in terms of like skins, in terms of like the trophy case, you know, really iconic things um, mm -hmm. for that crowd and that community for League of Legends. So uh, it was really nice to see that happen um, because fashion is personally an interest of mine as well. So it's, it, was, it was fun to see that, yeah. All right, cool. Uh, Dan, you want to say thanks? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, you want to add on to that? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh... No, yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, I think at Riot, we, we definitely think that player experience comes first. So I think anything that we do, um, you know, we're just trying to give players the best possible experience and, and really legitimize their passion and show the rest of the world how awesome it is. So, yeah, thanks for the kind words. All right, all right. Uh, your, yourself, what about the uh, benchmarks that you think uh, are good for yeah. new, new newcomers to have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think um, one that I that always impresses me is Nike. Um, so, I mean, I follow a lot of Nike or I follow, you know, you follow the news on social media and things like that. And I'm always impressed at the speed and velocity in which Nike is able to put out ad campaigns that really speak to the current world events. Um, they're really on top of just knowing what what's what the world is talking about and then creating a message that ties back to their brand and their values and really makes it appear like, you know, they're 
not only supporting the community and understand what everyone's feeling, but they're able to tie it back to their own brand and, and then really push themselves to the forefront of uh, all the different conversations that are going on. So yeah, I think Nike is, is a very impressive brand for sure. Okay. Okay. I think, uh, I think it touches on a really good point as well. Relevancy is super important in esports. Things come and go. There's no longer a time where you can sit and deliberate for half a year before making a decision in esports because things go out and uh, in and out of trend really, really quickly. So, uh, you know, gonna need some new blood on this, you know, people that can adapt to the changing meme culture and current events, like you said. All right. Now uh, I want to move on to one final question before we take the Q and A from the chat. I, I like that a lot of you guys have been asking questions. Discord in chat as well as uh, some of the PMs. So really nice. Uh, keep the questions coming. Get those questions ready because in uh, the after this question, I uh, will be taking uh, your questions from chat and giving it to our panelists. All right. So the final question is: We have talked about all the serious stuff. You know, all the do's and don'ts, and don't wear tattered jeans, don't wear singlets. You know, be professional. Delete your social media history. Now let's talk about the nice things. All right. What is the carrot to joining esports? What have you personally experienced? that was so wonderful in an esports career? Um, I'll start with this. So I remember that um, I think the first esports event I did was traveling around uh, SCA with the StarCraft players. And I was actually very impressed by the players where they're full-time students. Um, they are carrying around a book on um, StarCraft strategy and then on the other side they have like their science and history books that are studying for school. Uh, it really changes the perspective that hey gamers are just lazy, you know, they just play games. <laughs> but it's not true. A lot of them are extremely, extremely smart. They take their gaming seriously. They know exactly when to um, when to release an ultimate, for example, they calculate down to the very second. At the same time, they're also very smart in the sense that in school, uh, they, they use their knowledge uh, to be most effective in their studies. So I, I've seen that kind of experience. And then it makes me feel, um, it, it gives me a sense that I want to help this group of people. I want to help build esports and show people that it's not just people playing in their basements. Uh, we really have professionals who dedicate their lives, their time uh, be in perfecting a skill that they have. So I think it's really commendable. And um, I think one of the, my proudest moments was um, standing in the middle of the Singapore Indoor Stadium. And then when you turn behind, you see 8,000 cheering fans uh, at the last match during the Dota Singapore uh, World Pro Invitational. Uh, that was really a heartwarming feeling that it was like the team who put together everything, you know, so that was good. Cool. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think from, from my end, um, so I think, you know, I, I got into esports basically when I was working at Capcom. So we were, you know, basically I was part of the marketing team helping to lead marketing for uh, Ultra Street Fighter 4 and we were trying to figure out, you know, what's what's the way that we can sell Street Fighter 4 to the community for the, the 10th time, right? Because, you know, Capcom is pretty, pretty well known for, for, you know, selling games again and again, and we needed the, a way to get the, the community excited. Um, and then eSports was something that we, we actually, you know, we had heard about, we didn't really know, but we knew that we had uh, a really strong grassroots community um, within the fighting game scene. So part of uh, my job at Capcom at the time was to help create the Capcom Pro Tour, which ended up being, you know, basically an um, umbrella structure around all the different existing grassroots tournaments. Um, so that was really fulfilling to me because I got to work with all the different tournament organizers and then get to meet all the different players who had been playing uh, Street Fighter kind of like, I'm not going to say casually, but there wasn't a lot of big support from, you know, the companies or any kind of corporate um, side. So being able to be in that corporate position and then give the grassroots, um, kind of like the spotlight that they had deserved for so many years was, was a really fulfilling feeling. And then that ended up becoming a really big success for Capcom. Um, you know, they created an esports department right after that. And then, you know, shortly after all the other fighting game companies also started to do their own tours, right? So like Tekken decided to do a tour, Mortal Kombat did a tour. So it really, it was like a really uh, epoch moment within fighting game esports, and I think that that's definitely you know one of my proudest achievements for sure. You created jobs, all right. Very well, yeah. very nice, very nice. All right, give yourself a pat on the back for that. Yeah, yeah. 
All right. Uh, what about you, Beatrice? I think you shared a little bit about your journey with Secret Lab, but uh, you know, did you do you have any anything else you want to add? We're, yeah, we're down mean, for another emotional story. <laughs> it's not gonna be emotional, but I think <laughs> um, you know, I really, I really enjoy working along alongside my colleagues at Secret Lab. Everyone's super highly driven. So I'm, I would say, you know, beyond your interest in gaming, if you yourself, right, um, your personality, your your character, you're just very, very, very driven. You like a fast paced kind of uh industry and environment you know and you have like a wide range of interests i think gaming is definitely one that you should consider um not just i mean secret lab really allows you to have like gives you that platform to explore the different interests but you know not just secret lab i think even for like one esports and riot and all the other companies that are in gaming you know you really get to um, expose yourself to a lot of people from different cultures because gaming is so international right like mm -hmm. southeast asia it's like i i Honestly, because Secret Lab is, is a global like kind of gaming chair company, I don't just deal with you know the local uh, Singaporeans or even just within Southeast Asia. Most of my emails actually come in at midnight, you know, from the US um, and from Europe as well. So it's you know if you really enjoy like learning mm -hmm. about different cultures and about and just interacting and understanding different you know how different minds work and 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 how the different industries you know for riot how do, how do things work for riot how do things work for one esports how do things work for resurgence you know i think esports is any job in esports you know really allows you to do that because you know you get chances to you know attend um like tournaments conferences and stuff like that and you get to meet a lot of people where you can really learn more about i think gaming in general is a very supportive industry compared to others where it's a little yeah. bit more like close and selfish and you know so I, yeah, yeah yeah exactly okay okay yeah, uh, yeah i see felicia laughing at that i'm sure you know working corporate <laughs> for a long time does uh exp expose you to these kind of uh, you know less nice things yeah. about you know about working life but uh, i think uh, you know to wrap this up i think about Esports myself, you know, as a broadcast talent, you know, I have gone to different countries and get it, got a chance to see esports events like you, Beatrice. You know, I got to work at some of these, you know, talk to the big crowds. And uh, I think what really speaks to me personally is the fact that, uh, you know, the personal part is you know, growing up traditional Asian household, you know, gaming is always kind of frowned upon as a pastime once you're a certain age, you know, gaming still, you know, still gaming, you know, Chinese New Year is always weird uh, where, you, where, where, you, where you say your career is in gaming. So it is something that's always spoken to me when it, when people think that esports isn't a proper thing. And when you go to these events, you're proven wrong, you know, because these things are on the level of the proper sporting events that are, you know, getting the worldwide recognition. And, uh, you know, seeing esports grow from the 2010 era to the 2020 era has really, uh, you know, made me a lot more positive on a lot of these things. So for those of you in the chat, still uh, you know, saying that, okay, I want to take my gaming passion into this career, into this uh, esports career. Well, you know, I, I really wish you all the best. I hope this whole panel has been useful. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions, I think now would be a great time to, you know, send them to us. I think our boys, at produ in, girl, boys and girls in production have been, you know, sorting through the questions that you guys have been asking throughout the session. And uh, I think we should have them ready for the... Uh, question answers but uh, for now thank you so much for guys uh, if you have any questions keep sending it in I'm going to be throwing it back to Alicia uh, to ask the Q&A to our panelists thank you panelists for all your sharing and thank you for your emotional stories tidbits as well as lessons cool so thank you everybody and thank you Thank you, Lysander, for moderating the panel. Um, so we have had a bunch of questions come in. Um, I'm just going to open it up to the rest of the panel and even Lysander, if you think um, you know it's suitable for you sure. to also begin. Uh, so we're going to start off with uh, the first question from Teddy. How important is it to be aware and fluent in different languages in each of your professions? Like, is English alone okay? Do you need to be bilingual? Uh, yeah, I can take this one to start. Uh, I think it's it's definitely definitely an advantage. Um, so I think you know everybody you know strong command of English is going to be number one, of course. But you know, as as everyone said, you know, esports is becoming such a global phenomenon that um, any kind of additional language ability that you have, especially if you're applying for a job uh, within Southeast Asia, is it's going to be really important. So if you have ability to speak Chinese or, you know, Thai or these, you know, Filipino, uh, Tagalog, these languages that have 
um, burgeoning esports markets. It's definitely a leg up, uh, and it really depends on your role, right? So, for example, when I like the story of how I got into Capcom was I actually joined Capcom as a translator for Japanese to English. Um, because I, like I said, I, I started toys at, at Bandai in Japan, uh, but I wanted to get into gaming, but I didn't know how. So my only in was, hey, Capcom, you're a Japanese company. I speak Japanese, and I love fighting games. I can tell you all about the fighting games, and then let me, you know, be your voice when you talk to your Japanese developers. And, you know, that, that was a story that resonated with them because I had that language ability, uh, and I went into my interviews really touting my strength, right? Because I knew that that was one thing that could give me an advantage over other candidates for that specific role. Um, so that's just one example of how, yes, language can be an in. And then that, that later helped me transition to doing marketing, to doing esports, to where I am now. But it was all due to that Japanese language ability to start. Okay. Okay. Hey, um, um... Okay, I think, I, I think, oh, okay, no. oh, okay. Oh, okay, so I think it's just adding on to that. Uh, personally, I had uh, gotten a job before in Taiwan because they were looking for an English broadcaster that could speak, uh, you know, could commentate in English, but also speak Chinese to the Chinese production. So uh, apparently that is pretty rare in Southeast Asia. So I got shortlisted uh, without even applying for the job. So, you know, being able to speak double languages, like uh, he said, or even triple languages in the countries with esports scenes actually does help a lot when it comes to securing jobs. I'm pretty sure not just for commentary, but also for other work. Yeah. Okay, so I think we'll move on to the next question. We had a couple of the same uh, similar veins. So, um, you know, for people who are, you know, maybe in their 30s or in mid-career, um, but they're looking to get a job in esports, even though they don't have relevant uh, experience, um, you know, what advice do you have or, you know, is it too late for them to join esports industry? I don't think it's too late. I think what Dan P said earlier about professionalism and having somebody the relevant experience and teaching them about esports is actually not that difficult. So if you are, so for example, um, there are business development jobs in esports, there are, there are also um, um, partner account servicing um, roles in esports, there are event production in esports, there are events management roles in esports. If you manage an event, let's say for one esports, for example, if you have project managed an event before uh, in a totally different uh, industry, but you still have the relevant project management experience. And if you are also a gamer and have been following esports actively, that seems to me like a perfect match. So uh, honestly, if you don't have the relevant esports experience, I think that's not as important as having the relevant experience for the role. Cool. Um, any other panelists before I move on to the next question? I think it also goes oh, back okay. to what Dan said about the, you know, how he started as a translator and then you know, just because of his you know, passion and his eagerness to help, it just grew into something bigger and what he has achieved today. Uh, yeah, so don't, don't, don't think it's uh, too late or, you know, or you know, I don't think it's, that there is a bit cliche, but I don't think it's ever too late to you know, pivot, especially if you have a passion and the uh, experience to you know, do stuff. And also, I wanted to add on to Lysander's point earlier as well, like about, you know, getting and understanding gamers. You don't have to be a gamer yourself, but just understanding gaming culture, um, even from a top level, I think is useful. Um, yeah. Yeah. No cool. struggle. Right. <laughs> Next question is, um, what is a job in esports like exactly? Considering that you know mm -hmm. there's a wide range of skills and positions available, uh, but what kind of work life can a student or a newcomer expect uh, when they join the industry? I guess that's quite varied, lah. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think this one depends on the company, right? That you're joining and the culture. Because every company has a different culture and a different pace, you know? Like, I mean, gaming in general is fast, but I think different companies also have a, like a different pace of working, right? So for me, um, maybe I can share a bit more about my experience, right? When I came from being a student um, to joining Secret Lab, 
the start was definitely challenging, you know, um, because there's a, there's quite a steep learning curve, especially in my role. I mean, you can't, you don't really study partnerships, you know what I mean, or like sponsorship in school. It's not something that I, I'm able to immediately value at too. Um, but you know, I was very fortunate to have um, Alaric kind of like mentor me about this uh, and kind of like guide me and show me, you know, how things should be done. Um, also, a lot of work on my own end to kind of be reading and reading articles, um, you know, on Esports Observer and all that to really keep myself um, abreast, you know, uh, uh, in terms of like the latest news and all that. Um, I would say, um, as as a student coming into the industry, another important. I think ultimately when, you know, companies are looking for new hires, right, they're really looking at people who can provide a fresh perspective and can value add. So it's important for you to really stay on top of trends, you know, be, be, be very clear in terms of what you can really contribute to the company. So I think I, I had a conversation with Felicia like before and she was sharing that, you know, some candidates, they even dissect the website or dissect a certain project, right? And they say, oh, you know, this is how I think this, this can be improved. So I think that also carries to like my role at Secret Lab and when we hire for, let's say, a partnerships role, which we are hiring for, um, it's, you know, like saying, okay, so this this is what you've done. I can see why you've done this. And this is what I would recommend for the next steps, you know, showing that you have understanding and, um, you know, ideas in terms of how to improve things and processes. I think that's, I think that's very important. So it's kind of really making sure that you're able to offer that um, and just prepare to be working hard for the first few years. <laughs> yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah, the working hard part, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Really, yeah, I do agree. It really depends on the role. Mm -hmm. If you're in events, uh, expect to work every weekend that the event is running. So that is really typical. Uh, and events never has a working hours. Uh, no matter how you plan for eight to six, it never happens that way. Um, if you what if you follow esports and you see esports tournament, a best of five could end in three games or a five game. If it's a Dota, it could overrun by two hours easily. And if you go around the entire league, that could be three four hours on a daily basis. So there's really no way to plan. So if you are if you're really keen to join esports and you want to invest, uh, you have to make the necessary sacrifices as well. Uh, be prepared to uh, have. It's late mornings, late nights, uh, all weekends. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's an extremely fulfilling experience. Um, having finished the tournament, looking at the competitors and how satisfied they are, and knowing that you've got millions of viewers watching what you have put together, it's, uh, it's a really proud moment to have after every event. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so next question. Um, how important are connections in landing a job in esports? Or rather, I guess, networking or making connections in the industry? I think having connections is important in anything you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's yeah, not just industry. applying for esports. Yeah, in any industry, uh, if you know someone personally, you already have an advantage uh, in having somebody know, knowing you better. So it's not just for users, I'll say, yeah, it, it is important to get as connected as possible for two reasons. One, you are able to know more about the industry and more about the role before actually applying for it. And the second thing is that um, it also gives the recruiter or somebody in the industry uh, an, an opportunity to be your advocate. So for example, if I, if, I, if I know somebody who is good at a certain role and I introduce them to a company, uh, there's a higher chance of the person having an interview versus um, just going through um, a social network application. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So we're going to squeeze in one last question before we end this uh, session. So um, how can local companies help, you know, players to blossom to their full potential, similar to Sien, using him as an example? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Shen is, is, a, is a great success story for, for esports, especially, you know, in Singapore. Um, I think he's a great guy, by the way. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think what, what local companies can do is help sponsor players, help get their name out. And I think that, you know, what we've seen in, in the recent years is that um, being a personality and really having a brand is, is becoming super important for companies, you know, being an influencer in that regard. Um, so I think esports has grown from being 
you know, simply being a competition between the best to see who's, you know, the strongest player to who's the best, who's, who can be the best player, but also have a multifaceted faceted personality and different kind of business lines. Um, so I think that as esports continues to grow and we see you know, influencer culture and influencer business begin to grow, those two things are going to begin to merge. So how local companies can help support competitors to get them out to tournaments, <clears throat> help them grow their brands is going to be uh, really important. Yeah, I think uh, touching on what he said, I think influencer culture is really big in esports. And, you know, here in Asia, we tend to be a bit more pragmatic about things. Uh, is there a purpose to focusing on esports if it doesn't yield any kind of monetary value or career value. So I think uh, local companies, you know, can definitely try and like, uh, instead of just giving them products or just supporting them products wise, I think it helps to, you know, build, uh, build a brand image with like, a, I, okay, I think a good example is how sports brands actually get a whole bunch of influencers to go to a retreat and do exercises, workout days together, and they have this whole title for this whole thing. So it kind of gives the, it elevates the whole branding of being a player uh, to the audiences, you know, make something more prominent than rather than just slapping a logo on them, I think uh, is what I'm trying to say. But uh, yeah, just touching on uh, Dan's, Dan's point as well. I think brands also have to understand or lo local companies have to understand that esports is a long-term investment. Uh, it's not a opportunity where you go in for a month and then you expect immediate ROI and you come out the next month. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if you want to invest in esports, whether it's in a tournament, a league, a player or a team, have very clear goals set aside work on a long-term strategy, at least a three to five year plan, so how you want to support this particular team or person, and then build from there. Yeah. So I think that's key. Yeah. I think Beatrice is Beatrice uh, muted. Yeah. No, Beatrice, sorry, we can't hear you. Can you check? Mm -hmm. Can try now? Uh-oh. Oh no! No mic. All right, quick, write it out on the whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, okay. I agree. Okay. <laughs> Right. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, that's uh, all the time we have for today's session. Um, thank you to our panelists, Lysander. Thanks to everyone for joining, and also, you know.